much for coming to the Girls Online panel. Um, I'm really excited. <laughs> you could have been anywhere in the world, but you're here with us, and that's great. So thank you so much. Um, I'll just jump into it. I'm really excited to talk to these wonderful women. Um, I'll let them speak a little bit more about themselves, but as you know, we've got Tavi Gevinson from Rookie and Everywhere. <laughs> from Hello Giggles and again, Everywhere. <laughs> She's a contributor at Hello Giggles and also a cool high school team. <laughs> and Vivian Wilson, who is a contributor at Rucky and also an activist, feminist, and you can see her everywhere. She's just at a TED Women talk, so yeah, she's great. <laughs> and I'm really your host for the midday. Um, so basically, I just want to break this down into a few different things, and we will open up to questions because I'm sure you all have loads of them. Um, but I'd like to start by talking um, about the early days of both sites. So we'll probably talk a little bit about creating and moderating a community. Um, how the sites have created offline opportunities for you, yourselves and others. And um, yeah, how your sites have created, I already said that, wow. <laughs> and um, we'll just take some questions from the audience. So let's jump in. This one's for Tavi and Ruby. Um, so you were both very young when you started your online writing. Tavi, you were 12, right? Oh my gosh. <laughs> and Ruby was 10 writing at Hello Giggles. Um, so how was your initial reception online being so young? I don't mean to put you on the spot, I was trying to be polite. <laughs> um, um, okay, uh, I guess at first, um, a lot of uh, my blog garnered attention because I was so young and a lot of people thought that like my parents were writing it or that I was like an old man, <laughs> which I obviously am. <laughs> blogging community because it was a fashion blog it was like other girls or young women and I feel like there were a handful some of whom I'm like still in touch with today or even like very very close friends with who understood me and were supportive of me and thought it was good that I was doing something that I cared about but there was a lot of skepticism and I feel like it I feel like by now, no one cares, <laughs> but, or they know I'm not an old man, but um, yeah, at first I think the reception was like a lot of doubt, and then once it was clear that I was real, um, a lot of like, well, should she be missing school for <laughs> so, <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> I was like, yes. <laughs> but um, yeah, I don't know, stuff like that, skepticism. Yeah, I, th I, I completely agree. When I So I was nine when I started a Tumblr, um, because my mom had a Tumblr, and I was having a really hard time uh, in elementary school because people were really mean to me. Um, so I, my mom was like, you should write about it. So I made a Tumblr, and I started blogging about how certain, like, different things that happened to me and, like, things I disagreed and agreed with, and... Uh, like it started getting picked up by like, like I got like 23 reblogs, which was like a huge deal for for me as a nine year old girl. Like, oh wait, people actually care about what I'm saying. So then when I was 10, uh, Molly uh, got in touch with me and was like, hey, we're starting this website and you should contribute. And I was like, awesome. And at first it, there was definitely a lot of like, oh, she doesn't know what she's talking about because she's. 10. <laughs> also, again, like, oh, you're definitely not a 10-year-old girl. Like, this is your mom writing it for you. Um, but I think, overall, the, the fact that I was 10 contributed a lot to, well, like, the attention that was drawn to it. Mm -hmm. Nice, nice. Okay, so I have a question for Sophia, because you were, you know, you co-founded the site with Zoe Deschanel and Malls. Um, so, you know, I'm, I'm close to your age, I think, but the internet was kind of, you know, a lot of people weren't blogging. It was sort of seen as, like, the weird thing. The internet wasn't, like, social media wasn't huge. So what was that like, making the choice to, like, you know, you had had already a lot of success just traditional writing. Um, so how did it become a thing where you were interested in making a blog online and, like, taking that risk? Um, I was sort of just a really big fan of Molly, our other partner. I saw her Tumblr and... I was obsessed with these vlogs that she did where she would just be like getting drunk with her mom. Um, <laughs> and I thought that was so cool. I'd never seen anyone like it. Um, and so I asked her, I wanted to start a funnier dive for women, so it was supposed to be for video. And then Molly was the one who suggested it. Uh, we're going to get our own. That's why. 
Thank you. Um, no, I was really obsessed with Molly. I was such a big fan of hers. And then she, we went out to like 50 of our friends and family and asked them if they wanted to write for us. And Ruby was one of our friends and family. Um, and it's really, I was really more of a fan. Okay, cool. Very cool. Um, let's see what else. All right. And Jamia, I have a question for you. Um, so obviously you're outspoken feminist. You, you know, did this TED Women yesterday. Um, and you're, you're just, you know, you're out there just doing the speaking. Um, so when you started contributing to Rookie, what was your goal as far as storytelling, and did online storytelling to a younger audience present any unique opportunities? So I met Tavi at TED Women. I just realized that <laughs> now, <laughs> a while ago. Um, and then that is kind of what was the impetus for me starting to contribute to Rookie. So that is kind of an interesting intersection for feminism and, and those crossroads happening. I think for me, the kind of writing that I've been doing and the kind of professional feminist jobs and organizations that I've been a part of, a lot of times that writing was about policy and research and things that had to do with the world that I care about, but it seemed very much outside of myself. Yeah. And Rookie provided that space to have those conversations about the lives that we live and the intricacies and the nuance and the complications of these issues and also to not have cautiousness about liking all the things <laughs> that um, some different other waves of feminism might deem complicated or bad. And so for me, I was really excited about being able to talk to younger women uh, about these issues and to also release some of these stories and questions that I've had within myself uh, that were still lingering on. And I think also because a lot of the people that I work with are young people and that I mobilize in my work, I feel that it's also added an, exponent, um, an exponential amount of accountability to me that I always, I have a journal entry from when I was working at my first job in Planned Parenthood as their national youth organizer. And in that journal I said, please always remind me to be accountable to my 14 year old self because I felt that that wasn't something that I always saw with leadership in different organizations that I was working at. <laughs> and so that was something I had written to myself, and then it came back a lot of the time with Rookie that these pieces just didn't lie on their own, that the interaction with the young women that I meet at events and the comments and just learning about people's lives and the way that we were having these conversations just felt very nourishing and also um, allowed for more holistic conversations to happen without worry about political implications yeah. and judgment. Absolutely. So it's good that you brought up comments. Uh, I actually write for Rookie and Hello Giggles, um, and you know I've noticed that it's mostly very positive, like very positive feedback in the uh, comments. And I make YouTube videos. I am not unfamiliar with like harsh and cruel comments. I'm a woman on the internet. Let's be real. Um, <laughs> and so I would wonder how you all have um, handled or like gone after the vitriol or like the criticisms, and like how do you all deal with it? How do you maintain a positive community online? Mm. Um, well, it was really funny to me that you said that, Jamia, not to be like, yeah, me too, but like, <laughs> I literally, I got here really early and I was lost and I sat on the floor and was turtling because I had feelings and um, <laughs> I, I guess I have been, because a lot of it was like from my bedroom and I lived in Oak Park, Illinois and now I live here and so I come into contact with like the kinds of people who like, wrote about me when I was younger. And I wrote in my journal, I was like, just write for who you were when you were 12, and think about the people you looked up to, and who you admired, and like write for that girl. And I feel like, rookie, thankfully, I don't have to do a lot, like I just don't, I feel like it's clear that it's a space for young women, so other than the occasional weirdo with a username, one was literally disappointed dad. <laughs> that it's the space for young women and within that there can be disagreement but even then I find that people are very respectful and um, I think it's kind of like there are uh, people want to like keep a space safe and a, a place where like people can try on different ideas which I think is a very natural part of growing up also but mostly like I negative like who cares there's not <laughs> enough time you can't um, care well, I think the other thing, it depends on what you're writing, because I've written pieces that have been about, like, sisterhood and, like, how we should, like, 
especially when you write about a topic like feminism, um, it depends on the site and who you're like who is reading the article because I've written articles that have gotten such positive feedback, like yes, like oh that's so true. But then uh, when I was 13, I wrote an article for a website called Mashable about how I think uh, how I predicted that Facebook was going to start losing uh, teens. And when I wrote that article, like I had met like so many different websites like attacking me, being like, that's not true, like you don't know what you're talking about, you're 13. <laughs> and I, so a team. Yes. <laughs> I was like, okay, and like I'm 14 currently. Uh, I'm a very sensitive, I'm a human being. Um, I'm a sensitive, I'm a teenager uh, with feelings, uh, again. Uh, so it can be like, Seeing negative comments gets to me, like my mom's always like, oh, like you can't listen to them, but it, I mean, like it's obviously hard to hear, oh, you don't know what you're talking about, who are you, why are you writing on this website, you're 13. Uh, hearing stuff like that can be kind of, you know, not night uh, self-boosting to hear, um, but I think, honestly, if you're writing uh, your, like what you believe in and writing to your truth, I think that it doesn't matter what people say. I don't mean to know how Um, in the beginning, they were. Like when I was like ten, I wrote an article and it was like, "Hi, I'm Ruby." Um, it was uh, my first article on Hello Giggles was ten things about me. Uh, because I'm ten and you guys need to know everything about me. Um, uh, uh, so uh, one of the things I wrote was, "I love volleyball." Although at the time I had never played volleyball, <laughs> I really wanted to. I love Homer Simpson shirts. Um, I owned one of them, and it's the only thing I wore all of fifth grade. Um, but uh, people would, uh, you know, people would either be like, "Oh, you're so cute," or other people would be like, "Why are you writing? Why are you writing about this?" Um, but on Tumblr is mostly where I got the most of my hate because people would be like, "That this isn't you again. You're an old man." And I'd be like, ah, I'm not. Why are we all secretly old men? <laughs> But yeah, I think that actually uh, is very interesting because it, it kind of speaks to the idea that there are places online where, you know, specifically young women, um, are there's still questions, like when they're in their home pretty much, you know, like Ricky is a home for young women, Hell Giggles is a home for young women, but still they're like, you're not credible enough to speak here. And it's also weird that like grown men on Mashable would be like, how dare you to keep your <laughs> like obviously just like projecting, but like it's not you. Like, you know, some psychologists believe that when other people pop up in your dreams, they're just like a reflection of different parts of you. So you have to know that like Joe from Mashable is like sitting at home looking at his computer and he's just like, oh, this 13 year old girl illuminates some thing about myself that I don't like. <laughs> I have to take her down. I'm serious. Like when you look on Instagram, you're like, everyone's so happy and I'm not. Like there's so much room for projection. You just have to know that like it goes both ways. Like it's not, even if you're expressing yourself like really truly and that's really commendable, they like, I don't know, someone, Joe from Mashable, like it's, like, it's not you. So real, so, so real. Um, okay, I have one for Jamia, and this one might be a little bit of a bummer, but I think it's an important thing to speak to. Um, so, you're a woman of color online. Hello, me too. <laughs> <laughs> and IRL, weird, right? Um, and we share the same name, yeah. but my middle name is Akila. Right, they didn't plan that guy. Um, <laughs> um, I wish they had told me. Um, but, so I think it's interesting because there is sort of, you know, this unique intersection where you know, you are speaking as a woman and a feminist, but then also people can see you and people use their prejudice and bias against you. I mean, it happens to all of us. Um, but what have been your specific challenges and then how, like, how do you build a community that can see, not, not even see past it, but accept it and love it and enjoy the fact that you're contributing? Well, thank you so much for asking this question. I think it's something that I think about a lot. Um, I just heard Michael Kimmel give a speech about um, men and male privilege and white privilege at TED Women the whole time I had to, because I was in a hosting position, I had to keep my decorum, but the whole time I wanted to be like, yeah, yeah, raise the roof, Michael Kimmel! Um, and what was so exciting about it was he talked about that fact that we cannot deal with these sorts of oppressive systems without dealing with the entitlement that people who have power over others have. Because they, they don't have to wake up in the morning, when they first see themselves in the mirror, they don't have to see 
the black that has been put on them or the woman-ness that has been put on them. They see themselves as a human being first. And in his saying that, it made me really excited that there's a bridge that's happening, that, that that sort of self-awareness is happening, and that's why the writing that people of color and those who love us are doing online about these issues um, is so important because without it, we wouldn't be having these sorts of conversation in public space. I think, too, that, you know, I've always felt that black girls were magic, so I've had this audacity <laughs> to want to be writing because I feel like, who wouldn't want more of us and the haters? <laughs> just have issues. <laughs> uh, but I do think that the community that I have experienced from other young women of color who have come to me and said, the fact that you wrote about why you stopped straightening your hair and the progress that you went through, uh, the process that you went through to decide that that was the choice you needed to make, um, and then that's why I have an afro or locks now, is something that has been really exciting to me. And not to say that everyone has to make that hair decision, but for people who read my story and why that was something that felt like a political statement for me and who did it has been powerful for me. Also, I speak at a lot of all-girls schools because I went to one and I will often meet with lots of young women of color who will say, I want to write for Rookie, I want to write for magazines who are doing this work because I want people to know my story because you can't write about everything that's happening about us. Your perspective is not the only perspective. And I totally love that too. And so I think that if you can't see it, you can't be it. And that's one of the reasons why I do this work. But then also, the, like we were talking about before, I always uphold Rookie's comment section when I talk to places that I work. So I used to work at TED, and there were entire symposia about the comments. And how do we work with other media platforms about making comment sections less toxic? And I always say, Rookie, look to Rookie Magazine, because that's, it's about how you do the work. Gloria Steinem always says, the means are the ends. If you're doing the work in a certain way, it will create an environment for dis discourse to happen in the way that you create it. And you will get the occasional asshat that will <laughs> emerge into those sections, but I've been very wonderfully surprised by the community that Rookie has. I've written a lot of pieces on race and controversial topics around that, and I would say 95% of the comments have been supportive, and where there are where there is dissonance, it's usually about questions that people have about how I arrived at a certain point, and what was it in my experience that led to that point or people wanting to know more. So I found that being a part of this community has made me feel really strong in the work and also helps nourish me when I need to fight in more hostile places like Fox News, which has also been a place, a place where I spoke. Well. <laughs> 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 where it's not as easy to be a magical black girl. Yeah, yeah. Oh my gosh. I don't think, do they, like, do they know you exist? It's like, you know, like, you must be a magical, like, ethereal being now. <laughs> oh, man, well. Um, so since we are at BookCon, I'd love to bring it back to books. Uh, I know I'm really excited to hear about what you all are reading and what's interesting to you. Um, I'll do a little bit of plugging for you, but please feel free to plug anything. Um, Sophia's first novel, or is this your first novel? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, it just came out May 12th, A Tale of Two Besties. Please check it out. I read it. It was wonderful. Um, the fourth rookie yearbook. It's coming out October 20th. Um, so, yeah, we're going to talk about books, TV, performing, taking it to the streets, you know, all that jazz. <laughs> um, so this is a question for everybody, and feel free to, you know, say whatever you're feeling. Um, but you're all giving talks and performing. You're on Broadway, Tavi, that's amazing. <laughs> I'm like, yeah. as I do this. Um, so, yeah, what was, like, the tipping point in your career when you all were writing and you knew, like, there were going to be other opportunities? It's, like, more than a website. It's becoming, like... Not only people are interested in me, but people are now seeing that it's not just, like, it's not a blog, it's a life, it's, it's that. So what, what was that tipping point like? Um, <laughs> I guess for the site's like four years old, in the beginning I put it out of my house for like the first three years and I didn't think it was real. And then um, we posted something, something about body image, and we do a lot of that, so I'm not like being vague about it. but. They, someone posted, like, this is not Hello Giggles. And I was like, I'm Hello Giggles. Like, I know what Hello Giggles is. So, <laughs> some of us are, like, monitoring our, our, our brand. So I was like, oh, this is, like, a thing. Like, people are, like, telling me what's up with my own site. So that was the first time I was like, this is not about me at all anymore. So. About Ruby. <laughs> Um, which is not enjoyable, but I do it. Um, <laughs> but I need to 
Yeah, I yeah. So um, I did a TEDx when last year when I was thirteen, uh, and I talked about uh, feminism. Uh, and uh, going back to the negative comments thing, the video has thirty-seven dislikes and twenty likes. Uh, <laughs> so thank you all. Um, but uh, I don't like that. Thanks. Uh, thank you. Yeah. Um, but I don't know. So uh, that's kind of just one of those things where it's like. You kind because uh, you know talking about a topic like feminism and putting it on YouTube is never those two things just don't go hand in hand because uh, YouTube is where uh, the old Joes uh, are. Uh, but for me, uh, I'm still 14. Um, but one of the times where I was like, "Wow, this is really cool. I'm, I'm doing this." Was um, I do uh, we have a Hell of a Giggle show at UCB Theater, Upright Citizens Brigade, which is, there's two theaters in New York. Uh, we do it at UCB East. And um, we do shows there. And uh, at one point, I started taking pictures with the people in the audience, because I, I would be like, OK, everyone, like let's take a selfie together. And I think the time where I was like, wow, this is like real as I took a picture and like after the show I was looking at it and I was like wow like people actually like want to see me talk people want to see me uh, me and like other writers like do stand up and talk about our lives and tell stories like that's so cool like people actually care about what I have to say and that's pretty awesome. Ruby holds it down. Yeah. <laughs> I love that. You know that too. Um, okay um, and then I think it's really interesting because I think both sites you know, they obviously stand alone. Um, when you're on them, you know exactly where you are, and there's very much a culture that you've cultivated. So I wonder what's inspired that. Like, what what are the things that you see online, or you see out in the real world? You're like, I, I want to do something similar, or you know, that just made me think of something that could be a theme for the month. Um, like, what are those things, and how did you even arrive at that conclusion? That you know, maybe I'll have a monthly theme, or like, sometimes Hello Giggles has like very specific, um, like. What are those called? Like segments, articles, like basically those, like, yeah, editorial stuff. Like, what, how do you decide that? I'll say the night and then we can say the question. <laughs> <laughs> um, we, Zoe and I and Molly started the site because we were so annoyed at everything women's fashion and beauty and like gossip and snark and we we're so over like how to wear the dress day to night or like all that stuff. Um, so the site is basically like, everything like we didn't want in a website and that's why we really carefully monitor our contributors so they feel safe and they have like, I hate the word positive, but they do feel like they can express themselves. And another thing that we're really careful about, which is Ruby gave the example early on, is that it's not about personal blogging. That actually makes me really, we support your own personal blog, but this is not like an online diary because we want there to be a takeaway and some lessons learned. And that's, that's to protect our contributor, not necessarily to hold them back. Um, so that's why we sort of started it, to like use what Tumblr was, which is like personal expression, and sort of cultivate that into like a lesson learned. And Ricky does the very good job. Well, I was going to say the same thing, which is like, <laughs> uh, I hated everything. So. <laughs> but no, I mean, there are, um, there are publications for teenagers and for young women that I really like, and I feel like in, I was talking about this with Anna Holmes, who founded Jezebel, and she was saying, like, before Jezebel, everything online for women was, like, gossip, um, like, really, like, yeah, horrible fashion and beauty, whatever. And then by the time I started Rookie, it did feel like there were sites, because we started, like, around the same time. Yeah, like, a few months. Yeah. So, like, when I kind of knew I wanted to start it, I felt like there were really great sites for women, just not for, <laughs> like, teens. Or I felt like there were... Um, magazines for teenagers that I liked, but like I wanted a website that could be like accessible. But I also wanted to do this book, but um, I guess the, the things that I see that um, I don't know. I mean, I feel like I just fought, not like I'm like a creepy like spy, and then I'm like going back to a conference room and being like, so this girl's Twitter said this, but it just is nice to follow like smart young people and find out like what they're talking about and try to get them to write for us and um, stuff like that. So I feel like there's not, uh, I, it's hard to name like a spe anything specific that was influential, but like the most important thing is just seeing like what our readers want or like, you know, 
trusting my own instincts, like you were saying, Sophia, being like, I know what this is. So yeah. Awesome, awesome. Um, okay, so I this might be a selfish question. Um, <laughs> I am very bad at organizing my time and figuring out, you know, when to step away, when to like take care of myself. And so I'm super into this idea that's like big on Tumblr right now, is like self-care routines. So how do you all like step away and like relax after putting yourself out into the world? Like what is that self-care routine for each of you? Well, I'm laughing to myself because I'm wondering if Tavi's thinking about all the stuff that I put in our rookie Facebook group <laughs> about yeah. my self-care practices. I, <laughs> um, for some reason, that is the space, and it's because I love everyone who writes for Rookie, um, where I will put different herbal mixture recipes and things like that <laughs> to share with people. Um, or when we did Galentine's last year and my Galentine received um, special homemade essential oils that I made for her and crystals that I prayed over with feminist affirmations <laughs> in the box. And so I make those sorts of things for myself too because in my work, Rookie is actually a space of joy and happiness. But then in the vocal feminist world that I also work in, and, and Rookie's also feminist, but in the more of the policy space, and it's not always the happy space for me. So the self-care for me is really spending time. I really like making things for other people and um, also pampering myself and figuring out new ways to do that and also meditation and yoga. But I was just laughing when you said that because I know that I inundate that Facebook group <laughs> with a lot of those things. It's great. I'm not um, that involved. Like, I'm happy to pay someone to make me a juice. Oh, yeah, no, but I am into a lot into self-care. I feel like the biggest thing, I feel like for me it's not, um, a lot of the time it's just, like, accepting that you might seem mean or unavailable. Like, I leave social functions basically as soon as I'm, like, <laughs> not because I'm, like, I'm bored. But just because, like, I'm introverted and I know that I kind of have a certain, like, I need a lot of alone time to feel, like, basically sane and, um, like, there's a moment in Lost in Translation when Bill Murray, like, is talking to someone and then he sees Scarlett Johansson is leaving and he's like, I have to go right now. And he just walks away. And my therapist was like, you can do that. <laughs> like, you might look eccentric, but, like, I don't know. For me, I just, like, think about time a lot. So I'm just like, I, but I want to make sure I can, like, watch TV this week. Yeah. So, yeah. I think it's also really important, like, not, but not even talking about myself for, like, anybody, to when you feel yourself getting overwhelmed or when you feel yourself, like, when you feel like you have too much going on, I think it's always important just to like take a step back and like get a facial or like or go shopping just for fun not even like with a friend because I shopping with friends gives me anxiety because I feel like they're pressuring me to leave the store but I need time to like touch all the clothes in the store um, and I don't want to like have them be bored I, like I feel like you kind of need those days where you kind of take a step back like you don't need to bring a friend with you just go have like a day with like yourself i know often i like to just like get out my journal and like start writing make a blog post trying to i think everyone needs those days or like is having those weeks where they just need to like okay take a breath like take a step back and like just like treat yourself to some nice coffee um i turn my phone off friday night to saturday night for um Jewish holiday, Shabbat, but I don't have my phone now, so I'm like very present. Yeah, very present. Um, but I, because I have an internet company, I have to answer emails at all hours and all times, and I forget that like my company just like exists while I'm asleep. Um, so I turn it off for 24 hours. I stopped because I it was habit to like as soon as I wake up, reach for my phone, or like as I'm going to bed, be looking at my phone. And I tried to stop that because I don't like that that's like my first interaction with the world because I'm using the world as Twitter <laughs> instead of like the street and trees. <laughs> um, and I also think that sometimes like there's such an emphasis nowadays on like productivity. I'm often used as like an example of that and I feel weird about that because I think that self-care and relaxing is really important because if you're not it makes you a better artist or it makes you more productive when it's actually time to work. And um, I was listening to um, the podcast Professor Blastoff, 
<laughs> and yeah, I love it. It's Tignataro, who's like a beacon of sanity for me. And um, and they were interviewing Whitney Cummings, and she was like, when you don't, when you're only working, your art starts to imitate other art instead of life. So you need to like get fuel and refresh and remember what it's like to be a person, especially if you're trying to make work about being a person. Wow. <laughs> <laughs> Spit your mind. <laughs> Books. <laughs> Books. Books are happening. Here. Yeah, I mean, we have a, well, the fourth rookie yearbook comes it's out so in October. Oh, thank you. Um, yeah, well, we are, we've done one a year so that there's one for like every year of high school because they're like yearbooks. And right now we're working on the on senior year. And um, it's so, it feels like. Really, it's very um, satisfying and emotional, and I'm really excited about it. If you guys live in New York, like in the city, on June 23rd, I'm just looking at my mother. Um, uh, if you guys live in the city, uh, my mother's right there, uh, Marcel Carp. Uh, uh, June 23rd, uh, we have a Hello Giggles night at UCB East. Uh, it's five. Five dollars. Five dollars. Um, the theme. Uh, the theme is anything goes, which meaning not like the Broadway musical. That's what I thought. Because <laughs> um, Broadway. Um, but no, it, it's kind of like we can all just talk. It's um. I I host it. Uh, we kind of go up, uh, tell stories about our lives. We have five storytellers. Uh, or stand-ups or whoever uh, we have lined up and it's really fun. It's like an hour show and you guys should come if you are available <laughs> to 23rd. I'm so grateful that you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just like, yeah, we have that. So being a part of Rookie inspired me to want to write a feminist reader based on Beyonce Knowles. Oh, of course. <laughs> <laughs> and it's been taking me a while to get off the ground, but I will be having a call for submissions, which will be released via Twitter. But you won't be checking it in the morning or right before you go to sleep, <laughs> because that is important. Uh, but I would love for those of you who are so inclined to submit and also know that Beyonce apologists like myself will also be included, but we take all viewpoints about Beyonce. But that angle will be about Beyonce apologism and love. Just Don't take that. all opinions about Beyonce. Because <laughs> there's only one right opinion about Beyonce. <laughs> the agency will be editing the book, but we are open, not partisan. <laughs> so real. Um, well, I mean, I, I can ask a few more, and then I think we can open it up to questions. Um, but I guess, you know, like, speaking of inspiration and talking about, you know, Beyonce, God, you got me thinking, um, you know, what, what advice do you wish you had when you first started? Like, what do you wish you had known? Um, because I'm sure there are people in the audience who have blogs or who, you know, read blogs and are interested in contributing, but they're scared or they're not exactly sure what it entails. So what do you wish you had known before you'd gone into it? And how do you, like, get past that fear? I would say, first of all, in terms of like pitching to places and submitting your work, just, um, I know it seems like reductive to be like, just do it, don't be afraid, but there's no other way to do it other than to do it, I think was a quote that was in my high school hallway. <laughs> On Nike as well. Just yeah. Do it. Right. Nike, so inspirational. Um, but I think uh, you just have, you have nothing to lose. Like the worst thing that can happen is the, like, a, a publication like Ruby or Hello Giggles or any is like, um, not this time, but like send us more or whatever. So you have nothing to lose. And also you should just know, I guess we have like a mostly female crowd. And um, if you feel like uh, what you want to send in or what you have to contribute is like not good enough or something, just know that that's like not true and it's not based in reality and I think it's based a lot in that young women are 
taught to feel that way about their own stuff. And as an example, I will just share that a friend of mine who's a music editor um, got a pitch via Facebook chat from a man at like 2 a.m. that was like, hey, like this date is the 20th anniversary of whatever 90s alt album. Could I write about it? And then like five hours later, he was like, what do you think? My point is just that like, <laughs> I'm, being, I'm generalizing, but I think men are more encouraged to share their ideas, raise their hand in the past, stuff like that. So if you can see sending in your work almost as like a statement or like a radical act of taking up space, that's really important and you should do it. And you have nothing to lose and we all want to hear from you. Um, my lessons I wish I learned were actually very much about Marcel this year. She started Buzz Magazine. Do you guys know me? Um, yeah. But the lessons that I wish that I knew was I didn't really know what I was getting into when I started Hell Giggles. I thought it would be like this fun thing, and then I didn't realize it was like also a business. Um, and so, <laughs> as a being a business, is that uh, I think individual people are businesses in a lot of ways too, and that you need to protect yourself and you need to have. Um, situations where I think what we haven't done enough in Hello Giggles, which I think Ricky does a really good job of, is celebrating um, all the things that we're proud of and the people we're proud of because we're just so involved with what it is. And, you know, now we have like 16 million people a month and it becomes this like really intense business and we don't have enough time to be like the fact that Ruby hosts their UCB show every month in New York and I like to see pictures but I like don't really know what's going on. It's like focus on other stuff. But Marcel was really great with me and she started with two partners as well. And it was very clear that the most important part is to listen to your contributors and not worry so much about what the vision is because someone will show you that vision even if you don't. Because I never thought I was really that creative, but I'm really good at listening to people. So now I know. Just listen. Also, like when getting started, uh, I think I made, I made this mistake and I still make this mistake often, is I fall into this idea that I need to write to please others. Like, write to give uh to write so that people will be like oh yeah like that's so true but <laughs> like but i mean i think writing good writing comes from writing from your truth and if you're if you're writing about something you just kind of know about or something that like you want like an audience you want to appeal to but you don't really know how to say it i would just say what you really believe in because i know often i would try and write about things that I didn't know too much about, but I would be like, yeah, like, people are going to share this and reblog this, and then that's going to be good, but I think often I fall into the idea that, like, oh, I need to write so that I can, can, can get reblogs or shares, but you have to remember that writing isn't about who, how many people read your stuff, it's about writing how you feel and writing about what you believe in, and I think you can't forget that in, like, the mix of it. Yes, and I, I really believe in the fact that if we don't define ourselves, somebody else will. So we might as well do it. And that is for ourselves as individuals, but also the generation that we are a part of. And that's another reason why I write. Um, because I've written a piece of rookie about this, that I'm an extrovert. That People think I'm an extrovert, but I'm actually an introvert. <laughs> um, and so that I don't think that I've ever been able to say that in my workspace because I was worried about the professional implications of people hearing that because I work in media. But that's something <laughs> that has been a real issue for me. That I, you know, even before TED Women, I was having to twerk outside in the bed because I had all this restless energy <laughs> before going out there. And this ex-ISIS operative who was speaking with me on the thing, he and I were racing up and down the stairs because I said, I have anxiety. And I, and I, and this is what I need to do, but this is who I am. Yeah. Um, and so I've just been so empowered by that. Just like, just being my quirky, eccentric self and that people sort of deal with it. I mean, you can only imagine the looks that I got when I was out there going like this <laughs> before getting ready to hit that stage. But I felt really good afterward and it went really great. So I just want to say that just, if I had, been able to see my 14 year old self and all the things she was worried about and all the people that she was worried about in schools whose opinions really don't matter now ever ever <laughs> and if i could just see what they were doing now also <laughs> things would have been so much better but would be to just define yourself as my mom always said which she got from a russell simmons book <laughs> so i used to think it was cliche she'd always be like read one of these be rich be black be powerful books or whatever it was called <laughs> but um she would always say do you <laughs> 
And I think that's really important because when I stop trying to apologize or ask for permission to do me, things in my life just opened up. And so I think that really applies. And you know, you're going to not make everybody happy. You're going to have people tell you that maybe this or that's inappropriate. Or I, one of my favorites was like, well, you know, this is not the exact like exemplary form of leadership that you're displaying. <laughs> Something that was told to me. But I feel that it is appropriate for where I am and the people that I'm trying to reach. So I just think it's really important for us to define ourselves in, as Russell Simmons via my mom says, to do you. Awesome. And then I guess my last question before we open it up. What books are you reading? Or what book is your favorite book? Uh, I just finished um, What is the Woman at Park and Eleanor Park. Eleanor Park. Uh, so and it was, it, was, it was just over there. Did people just come from that? I think she was just over there. I read Landline and that uh, on a plane. And I was so good. I was like hysterically crying to both of them. That's what I'm reading. Um, I'm reading Speedboat by Renata Adler. And um, it's just making me like excited to be way older so that everyone I want to write about will be dead. Just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> I dream about that too. <laughs> I, oh, it's so hard. I have to wait so long. <laughs> read Bad Feminist on the Plane after seeing Roxane Gay nail her TED Talk yesterday, and it is so good if you haven't read it yet. I'm 14, so therefore, <laughs> <laughs> yes, um, if you guys are unaware, I'm 14. Uh, wait, how old are you? Uh, I was 15. Um, uh, so I'm, I'm uh, in ninth grade, uh, so I have to read the curriculum that my school supplies me with. Uh, but I actually, I just finished Catcher in the Rye. Uh, uh, who hasn't read it? Um, uh, but I, I really, I, like, I, I genuinely enjoyed it. Um, but now I'm reading, Mom, it's like, it's by David, this, this, something about a really great, the heartbreaking, what is it? It's like, this week gets to go to town for that. If I do, I just <laughs> <laughs> okay. I really like it. But it's a long title. It's a heartbreaking work of sadness. Wait, the what? A heartbreaking work of staggering genius. That's it. Hey, we got three of them. Yeah. Yeah. Words are good. <laughs> Christian 
black woman who comes from an upper middle class, college educated and grad school educated three generations family. My grandfather went to NYU way back in the day, one of the first blacks to ever go there. So my experience is going to be really different than others. So sometimes when I'm asked to speak on certain platforms, specifically around you know poverty and black youth, or I've been asked to talk, you know, you should be the one to talk to pregnant teens in Brownsville, Brooklyn about their struggle. And I said, I'm actually not the one, but I can connect you <laughs> to someone else because that's going to be insulting to them that you're bringing my bougie butt in there to tell them about their life. <laughs> so I also think it's like um, important to be honest with ourselves about that and to um, you know, help to steer other people in that direction when they're veering toward the tokenizing and that sort of thing. And to love and we do it. Um, okay, wait, I saw you first. Sorry. Hi, um, I just want to say I just moved to New York like a month ago and it's such like, a pleasure to be able to like, catch you guys. <laughs> Very surreal for me, sorry. <laughs> Um, you guys were talking a lot about like negative feedback and how you deal with it. I think that's so important. Well, I was actually really interested to know what is the best compliment you guys received. And I don't mean like, oh, this girl has so cute. I mean like, in terms of something someone said to you, and you felt very sort of empowered by it. The best compliment I've received? Um, that I'm pretty. <laughs>
You said you're 14. <laughs> Without letting it kind of, without surrounding yourself in your artistry, so to speak. Okay, wait, before you answer, I'll, I'll ask that to the room because you don't have a mic, so I'm sorry. Oh, sorry. <laughs> um, I'll paraphrase. You have a 12 year old daughter, you're an artist, and while well, it's great that she's creative and she's doing all these great things, how do you find the time to be a teenager and actually enjoy your youth? And surround yourself in a teenage environment because, regardless of the good and bad, you still need time to have those experiences to develop into a character. Yeah, I mean, I think my um, my mother, uh, she was laughing at me. Uh, she raised me. Uh, uh, yeah. uh, my mom's a single mom, um, and I don't have any siblings. I just have my dog. Um, so for me, like I've been raised in an environment where my whole life I've been raised around adults. So therefore, like my whole life, I was kind of just like, oh yeah, like hey, like talking to a like forty year old when I was five was like. Like oh this is like this is my friend. Um, wow, that sounds so sad. <laughs> I wasn't that sad, um, kind of. But uh, so I um, I feel like as like being a teenager in today's society, there's so much pressure to do so many different things, like to post this picture or to be this image or to do this. And you know I get a lot of like talk. Uh, for what I do, because you know I post everything that I do on like my Instagram and my Facebook, and all my friends are like, "Oh, like, oh, you think you're cool? Like, oh, you're pretentious. You're annoying." Like, and it's like, okay, but at the same time, I think every kid has that sense of just like being a teenager, and I think it, it's a matter of who your daughter surrounds yourself with. Like, I surround myself with people who make me happy, and I don't let people who I are mean to me. I don't let them into my life or let them into who I am and I think it's important growing up to be surrounded by people who make you happy and who make you want to be you and whether that be a 40 year old man or a 13 year old girl like if you're with people who make you happy because like I'm happy right now like <laughs> that this is good I like this and I think it's just a matter of who you are. Probably so. There's a girl in the back. You have a pink wrist, but yes, you. <laughs> um, well, um, my name is Claire. I'm 11, and I have a question for Ruby. So, um, so after your blog when you were younger, did people treat you any differently in school, like your friends? Yeah, I had to take things down. Um, <laughs> Because I, when I was 11, I made the mistake of using, um, I made the mistake of using names in my stuff because there was nobody telling, because I thought, for me, it was like a diary. And for me, it was like, oh, none of my friends are going to see this. I didn't realize that they could. So for me, I had to take things down. Uh, but when my friends read my articles, it does make me uncomfortable because it's kind of a part of myself that they're not seeing every day and as I said when you're writing you're making yourself vulnerable and it's a, like I'm writing about my opinions and sometimes opinions that I don't like to share with my friends and um, you know when they when they see that it's like kind of I kind of felt like embarrassed in a way but then but then now when my friends read my articles I'm like you know what go for it like I post them on my Facebook now I'm like hey look I was just I just wrote this article you should read it uh, because I think that when you write, you should be proud of what you're writing, and you should be proud of your opinions. And I didn't have that sense of self-confidence when I was 11, but like now, I think you all, if you ever write something or post something, you should always just own it because that's who you are, and like you should be like yourself. And if that's your opinion, that's your opinion. And if people want to pull it up when you're hanging out with them and be like, oh, like <coughs> what kids used to do to me is they would like pull out my articles and start reading them aloud to me, and I'd be like. Okay, you suck. Um, <laughs> it's kind of like, you know what, go ahead, do that. Like, that's what I think, that's who I am. Go for it. What was the joke there? They're like, haha, you're intelligent. <laughs> I, was, I, 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 it would be like, I, I would be like with all my friends, and then they would pull up my TED Talk and start playing it aloud to me. And I'd be like, why are you doing this? Like, I don't understand, this is 
me speaking about my thoughts in life. Ah. Yeah, maybe they're just like practicing for their reading of the audiobook. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, I saw you in the back. You have red hair. Hi there, it's beautiful. Um, I would love to hear how you guys deal with judgment or the fear of judgment when you are writing or performing, and how to not let that fear affect the creative process. Um, yeah, uh, fear and the creative process. Well, with writing, I take comfort in knowing that there's always editing. And I usually don't get to the good stuff or to a part where, like, when it just feels like I'm just going as opposed to, like, editing myself in my head before I can, can even get the words out. Like, I can't really get to that place where I like it and where it's therapeutic um, if I don't assure myself, like, you can always pull back later. Um, so I guess if you can fi figure out what the circumstances are for you where like you can do it and feel free and know that it's not, like sometimes um, for me, I have to start something as an email to a friend who I know is really non-judgmental. I have to start an article as like a, a letter to them. Um, or I'll start like recounting or like a writing down a conversation I had that day and I'll like build on the thoughts, but because I'm writing in my talking voice, it comes out a lot more naturally and less edited than if I'm like, I have a thought that I'm presenting. Um, but I guess then once it's out there, it's out there, like I'm so, I feel like I've published enough things where I look back and I like know that I was holding back or restraining myself somehow and it was a little boring or just a little, censored and I feel like the regret there outweighs the feeling of like, uh, I was really honest or something. Um, I think that even writer, like even when I don't disagree with certain things, uh, I find it commendable when people can put themselves out there. So, um, yeah, I hope that helps. Okay, I'm sorry, we're actually out of time, unfortunately. <laughs> Thank you all so, so much for coming.